Yeah, I have a lot of things to talk about. I see that a lot of people getting started in 3D. They buy 3D cameras or they wonder how to get started, how to participate in this club. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Here is the outline. I would, I would go through the steps. First, how do you take digital 3D pictures? Then how do you view them? How do you edit them? Edit them. The basic editing operations, alignment, cropping, adjusting the stereo window. Then how to improve them further, contrast, color, saturation, sharpness. How to prepare your 3D digital pictures to enter in this class competitions. And then I will show you my own personal workflow, how I do it today. Before I came here, I stopped at the Henry Ford Museum. I took some 3D pictures. I will put them in the computer and show you exactly what I was going to do when I get home, when I do it here. Now, I plan to give the file that you see here. You don't need to keep any notes. We're going to put in the website, in the club's website, so you can download everything that you see on the screen tonight. And I see Dennis Green here is recording in video, so if you want more of me, you can take the uh, DVD at home. Now, I classified the ways to take 3D pictures in four different groups. The first one is you can go and buy a digital 3D camera, most likely the Fuji W3. And when that camera came out last year, it was $500. I've seen it as low as $200. I think you can get for about $300 today. There is not much competition. We expected after Fuji came out that everybody would run out like Nikon, Canon, and have their own 3D cameras. The only really item of interest that appeared last month was actually last week. Panasonic is introducing a 3D camera. They've shown a prototype. Now, the prototype looks very much like the Fuji, only the lenses are closer together. That can be an advantage for portraits and certain subjects. Anyway, that's the first, the first choice. The second one, something that everybody in this room, I think, can do, like my friend here, if you have one digital camera, you can actually use it to take 3D pictures. You take a picture, you shift the camera, you take another one, 3D. It's that simple. Method number three. Now, you take two digital cameras, and somehow you make them fire together. I will show you how. And the fourth method, you use a regular 2D camera and some sort of a stereo attachment. Now, I'm going to show a few more details. First of all, if you can afford the Fuji, for me, that's, that was my entry to digital 3D photography. It is the easiest and the most convenient way to take stereo pictures. You click the shutter, you've taken a stereo picture, it's stored in one file. Everything is simpler. The only disadvantage of using a stereo camera is that the spacing of the lenses is fixed. Maybe that's an advantage because if it wasn't fixed, you, some beginners wouldn't know exactly what to do with it. But it's a kind of a limitation. Even though the camera, the Fuji, has specific ways that allows you to take it to take two pictures far away or closer together and then treat them as a stereo picture. It's called the advanced 3D mode, so the Fuji can do it. Now, in addition to um, having a stereo camera, there is a company called Cyclopical 3D that has produced a number of attachments for the Fuji camera that make it even more versatile. <coughs> there is a macro close-up attachment that reduces the spacing of the lens to 25 millimeters. There are 75 to start. Then there is this auxiliary lens attachment that allows you to put filters, flash, and, and, lens, and wide angle, and wide, and fisheye attachments, and nice things like that. And then they even have a base extender. So now this attachment in the bottom right corner extends the lenses to 225 millimeters to create the so-called hyper stereo. The attachments are expensive. However, they, if you already have the camera, you can increase the, uh, the things you can do with this camera. Now, the second method. A single 2D camera is uh, the easiest and least expensive way to start, especially if you already have the digital camera. All you need to do is take one picture, shift the camera, take another picture, and you're done. Actually, I know a few stereo photographers who they don't have a 3D camera. They shoot all the 3D pictures with a 2D digital camera exclusively. The big advantage is, is you're flexible how much to, you can move. There is a recommendation I put here. You can use like 65 millimeters, which is the spacing of your eyes. Or if you have an idea where the nearest object is, you can divide this by 30. And that's a good starting point. 
Now, when we were shooting film, trying to shoot film with one camera, there was always a concern about alignment. Oh, you have to be very careful after you take the first picture, you need to align the camera before you take the second one. With digital, there is software now, so this alignment can be done with the software. You don't need to worry too much. One disadvantage of this method is that nothing should move. After you take the first picture, everything has to stay still. Now, is that a problem for you? <laughs> it's a problem for many things. You cannot take portraits, the wind is blowing, you know, traffic, people, cars. However, you have buildings, you have tabletops, you have nature photography when things are not moving too much. So there's a, a lot of things you can do with it. OK, number three. Uh, this is a little bit more advanced now. You buy two digital cameras, and somehow, somehow you synchronize them. Well, the synchronization can be as simple as using your fingers. First, you put the two cameras in a nice bar. What I'm showing in this picture, I, have, I call this the um, super hyper bar. Actually, half of this, half of this is the, it, I used to call the half of this a hyper bar. Then I, I figure out, oh, I can put two of those together. Then I said to my wife, look, honey, here's a super hyper bar. And my wife says, isn't super and hyper the same thing? Yeah, super is in Latin, hyper in Greek. That's OK, you get the idea. <laughs> now, people have, be, have, have found sophisticated ways to synchronize the cameras because using your fingers, it's a starting point. But you know, if things are moving fast, you're going to have a problem. There is a method, stereo data maker, and then you can hardwire the cameras. Let me say a few things about each method. Certain Canon cameras, and that only applies for certain Canon digital cameras. People find and found an ingenious method that involves using a very simple cable and switch that you can buy for like 10, 20 bucks, connect the two cameras, and then they put software on the, on the uh, memories of the, the digital cards of the cameras. So all the, the software is free, by the way. You can download it from this website. And you press the switch, and now the cameras are perfectly synchronized. And there are a number of other things you can do. I've never done this myself. I have no experience with this system. A lot of stereo photographers use the system because before the Fuji came, this is what people were doing. And a lot of people that bought the Fuji, they still have this as you know an advanced method. Because once you have two cameras, you can separate them more. You can do a number of interesting things. Now, hardwired cameras, there is a gentleman in the Netherlands <coughs> that specializes in hardwiring those cameras. And I have, I'm going to show you my pair. It's exactly the one that you see in the pictures. What he does is he opens the camera. He soldiers a, con soldiers a connection. He doesn't alter anything else. You can use the camera exactly like it was produced, other than the fact there will be a wire coming out. So now we have two of those cameras with the wires coming out. You connect them, and now they're synchronized. You turn one on, they both turn on. You zoom one, they both zoom. You focus one, they both focus. And then you fire just one button, and they will both fire. OK? Now, here I'm showing uh, this method for me is uh, more advanced than having one digital camera, because you can always separate the cameras and put them you know, further apart. And then the same gentleman that wires them also has produced this little box here. It's called the macro box. He put one camera at the top, the other in the front. And one slides with respect to the other. And now you can take pictures with separation from 0 to 50 millimeters. So you can do hypostereos, macro, micro. So there's a whole universe of stuff you can do here. A lot of the macro pictures I've shown you in the club were taken with this setup. The fourth method sounds really very attractive. You can have your digital camera. You stick an attachment in front. And all of a sudden, your camera takes splits, splits the, the image into two, and it's a stereo pair. So it's very convenient. However, there are certain disadvantages. There's a limited range of focal lengths. Stereo base is limited. There's some distortion. I think this is a good solution for somebody who does mostly 2D and only occasionally 3D. Those attachments exist for film cameras, so they never became popular among the, the stereo group. So stereo, serious stereo photographs have stayed away from these attachments. But there is an option. You just buy the attachment for your specific digital camera, and you start taking 3D pictures. Here I try to summarize. 
its method, how convenient it is, how expensive the pluses and minus. Under files, if you're using a digital camera or the attachment, you only get one file. And this one digital file has both pictures sitting side by side. The other two methods will generate two files for the right and the left. This affects the subsequent processing. It's easier always to do one file versus two. Now in the table there, at this point I was going to take a break, turn the lights on, show you my equipment. I will do that at the end. I will demonstrate because I have equipment that fit all the categories except for the stereo attachment. Are you following me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got your digital camera, you have your Fuji. What's next? Well, what's next? The next step is you're going, after you go out and take some pictures, you have to transfer your pictures to the computer and you have to organize them. Now that's very important for me and that's I think one point where a lot of newcomers to digital might stumble a little bit. You have to create folders to hold your images. Oh, that's my, the first thing I do. You see on the left side, my new computer actually has a C drive and a D drive. So I decided to put all my 3D pictures on the, on the D drive. I created a folder called 3D Photos. Every month, I create a new folder. You see 1108, that's August of, of 2011. Now, I go in that folder, and every time I took a bunch of pictures, you see I, I create a subfolder, macro, mushrooms, frog, twilight, 8K, that's a bird, cats, <laughs> whatever. For example, today, there's going to be a new folder to hold my Henry Ford and Detroit visit pictures. Then in that folder, on the right side, Depend what, if I use only the Fuji, I create a folder that called MPO because all the pictures from the Fuji are in the MPO format. I will explain this in a second. Uh, right and left hold my twin cameras and then I have the macro box. I call it macro right and left. So I put there the files as they came out of the camera. Then I process them and I put them in the root directory. This is my process. I will show it to you in the end. But I really think before you start taking a lot of pictures, you have to think about how you're going to organize or you'll be unable to find anything in the future if you take a lot of pictures. Let me, let me talk a little bit about the file format. Everybody that has taken digital pictures have heard about the JPEG, the first line, JPEG. Usually has an extension of the letters JPG. It's a compressed and a very common, most cameras produce this format. When the Fuji came out, it used an unusual format. Nobody has heard it before. The MPO. MPO stands for multi-picture open format. It's a compressed format. Basically, it's like two JPEGs, pictures side by side, with some sort of information at the top that, that says has a little bit more information about those, what of those pictures are. The reason that this uh, standard was created, people think that Fuji created this format. No, Fuji didn't do that. The format exists any camera that takes more than one picture at a time and wants to put them all together in one file can use this MPO format, okay? Now there is the TIFF. A lot of people use that because it's lossless. It, you don't lose any information. When, when the file is compressed, every time it's compressed, you lose something. I personally use JPEGs because I don't think this compression, if you put it at the maximum, meaning the least amount of compression, I don't see any difference. But a lot of people go with formats that do, do not lose anything. Sometimes you see the GIF, that's mainly for graphics, BMP for Windows users, very large files uncompressed. So this see some examples. If you Google image file formats, you will see a lot more. Now let me tell you about the Fuji a little bit. As a default, meaning as it comes out from the factory to your hands, every time you take a picture, the camera will save two files. You look at the files, and one has an extension JPEG and the other has the extension MPO. The JPEG is only one side of the stereo picture. I think it's the left. It's only one side of the 3D image always. MPO is your 3D picture. So don't make the mistake to delete the MPOs because you don't know what they are. You can delete the JPEGs and as a matter of fact, in my camera I've changed the default. I don't want the JPEGs. If I ever need half of the stereo pair, I go in the photo editor and I grab half of it. I only save MPOs, which is what the 3D files are. Hey, George? Yes. The single JPEG 
the, the 2D JPEG that the Fuji creates is not one side of the 2D of the 3D image. It's actually a merge of the two imaging sensors. It actually contains information that's not in either. I disagree. I don't think that's correct. I've, I've, I've seen, seen, I've seen I pictures think it's only one like side on of the, the 3D. Well, it's not. You can see it. It's, you can see it's not. So how does it? Do, well, okay, we can discuss this later. But it's a 2D file. Now let me tell you, Windows and many programs do not know yet how to deal with MPO. If you go to Photoshop, I don't know if it's upgraded. At some point, most fo photo editors will be able to recognize MPO. Right now, if you click at an MPO file in your Windows computer, most likely it will come up and say, how do you, what do you want me to do with that? How do you want me to deal with that? Thankfully, though, there is a pro software called Stereo Photo Maker that does understand MPO, does understand stereo, and that's what I want you to use. <coughs> and that brings me to the next topic, Stereo Photo Maker. What is that? It's a powerful and free software that works with digital stereo images. It will do most of the stereo editing you need. It will also work as a viewer. You're going to view, crop, align, change size, formats, etc. using this program. You can download it from free from that website, and I show you how the, the program looks after I've loaded a stereo pair in it. It puts the picture left, right, and it's free. It's also it doesn't need any installation. You can put in a flash drive and carry it with you. It just an auto, it works on its own, and you can open also more than one stereo photo makers to do <coughs> different things. Now, getting started with Stereo Photo Maker, the program will do a lot of things. Usually there are three ways to do something. There's a little menu bar. You see at the top the menu bar? At the top it says File, Edit. If you click at those, you can see all the choices underneath. Below the icons, the left icon is Open a File. So to open a file, you can click File and then find the open file, or you can click at the icon, or there is also a shortcut. The shortcut is W. If you hit W, it opens the stereo image. So that depending on what I do, I might use any of the three ways. I might go through the top menus, through the icons, or th oh, I memorize the shortcut, and I think it's very nice. Like X, if you hit X, it will swap the right and left. Extremely useful for some people. After you load the file, if you hit the space bar, it goes to the next file on the same folder. By the way, it can only hold one image at a time. You load an image to go to the next one, you hit the space bar to go back, you hit the backspace. So, next topic. You've taken your pictures, you transfer them to the computer, you have Stereo Photo Maker. How do you view your pictures in 3D? Well, with Stereo Photo Maker, in your computer, you can load the picture, and then you can use one of those three methods I list at the top. Free view. Now, some people can do that. Don't feel that you are somehow something missing if you cannot do it, because there are a lot of people that cannot do it. Free view means they stare at the image and somehow they open their eyes, and the left eye looks at the left, the right looks at the right. This is called parallel. Or they cross their eyes. That's actually, for some people, easier to do, and you can view larger pictures. You cross your eyes. Now, your right picture, you look at the left, and the left picture at the right, but you have to reverse them, hit X, to turn them around with the stereo photo maker. So some people free view, and they like it. But for those who doesn't, you can buy a simple viewer. L'Oreal is a company that makes those, and I have one example at the table. Pokescope, there are viewers that have mirrors. They are really inexpensive or very expensive and allow you to view in your screen. Or you can use the Anagli format. One of the buttons here or one of the menus will turn this image, as you see down here, into Anagli. That means the right and left are superimposed. One is colored red, the other is colored blue. All you need to have at home is a pair of inexpensive red-blue glasses. I always have those glasses next to my computer because a lot of people put their images in this anagly format, so it's always handy to have it right there. So you turn your picture using Stereo Photo Maker. In anagly, if you put the glass on, you see 3D. OK? Now, these are the basic methods where you can do it right in your laptop or your computer screen. There are other methods. There's digital projection. That's what we do in this club. There are digital viewers. People found the iPod 
and this company made this product My3D, so now you can have 3D pics in your iPod and use the My3D to, it's a kind of a digital viewer. You can make prints. A lot of people made prints when it was only film, and now they find it easier to do it with digital. You can convert your digital images to slides and then use your slide viewers. Dennis Green has offered this service for our club. Or the last method, number eight, there are 3D laptops, and that's what I'm using right here. My laptop allows me to see 3D in here with a pair of polarizing glasses. There are very few of those around. There are also active 3D laptops where you have sire glasses. These are more common. Computer screens, 3D, or TVs. And that's where the future kind of lies right now. How many of you have a 3D TV? A 3D club, and only very few people do. <laughs> I don't. So. They're all waiting, you know, for the next technology. They're afraid to invest the money. At some point, you have to say, the heck with it. I'll pay the money. I'll get a 3D computer and then enjoy my own images, a 3D, sorry, a 3D TV. OK. So here we are. We took the pictures, put them in the computer. We can view them. Now it's time to edit them. And I'm going to talk about those three very important operations, alignment, cropping, and adjustment of the stereo window. Now alignment, you might say to me, well, I'm using the Fuji and the pictures are aligned. You know, the camera, that's the zone. Do I really need to align them? I say yes, because it's not perfectly aligned. <laughs> Let me show you what align, how you can align. The easiest thing, there's a little button that says auto align. All you need to do is click at this button. The computer will come up with a screen, you know, working, and all of a sudden when it's done, it will have a little summary. I, I blew it here, to, and it tells you what it did. Now, this is a picture that I took with my Fuji. I had somebody else take a picture of me after a race two weeks ago. Look what it did. It says here, first line. It rotated the left image a little bit. They didn't do anything for the right one. Size. It's, it increased the size of the left, decreased the size of the right. These are small amounts, but still a little bit perspective. Somehow it, it wanted to do. 0.7 degrees left, plus, minus, vertical and horizontal perspective. Position, that's the vertical alignment. That's number one in alignment. The pics should be aligned. So the Fuji, you think it's perfectly aligned. Still, there were seven pixels. The program thought that it was off, so corrected that. And when you zoom in, this is blown away. So you have more alignment problem, even with the Fuji. The last one, position, is actually the adjustment of the stereo window. The program. You can change it. There are some defaults built in. The defaults work fine for me. When you align something, it figures out where your image is with respect to the space, 3D space, and it adjusts the horizontal spacing. I will talk a little bit about this in a second. Now, what, what program is this? Stereo Photomaker. OK. Yes, I'm talking about Stereo Photomaker. Unfortunately, it only works for Windows computers. Mac users have found ways, either like running Windows emulations or one way or another. Some people even broke down and bought a Windows laptop or something just so they can only run Stereo Photomaker. This value here is really important. It tells you it says disparity of infinity points. That's essentially the amount of depth. Back in uh, film photography, there was a rule 1 over 30. They say the perfect amount of depth in a picture, well, a good amount of depth is 1 over 30. Mine says 1 over 29, so I'm pretty close to that by accident. Uh, if, if you don't have any near foreground, it's going to be a smaller number. If you exaggerate it, if you put too much depth, it's going to be a big number. So if you see a, a number that's way bigger than 1 over 30, and you come and project in this club, you might run into problems. There will be too much depth in the picture. So it's a nice thing that it gives you this information. This barrel distortion is not going to do anything unless you have set it this manually to always do the same adjustment. And that's what auto alignment is. Basically, when I take my pics from my Fuji, I <coughs> auto align all of them before I do anything else. And if you're using one camera, this alignment is even more important. When you use two cameras, it's also important. So I align my picture, and now it's time to do a little cropping. You see the composition on the left? This is typical. Whenever I give the picture to my camera to somebody, I see immediately they put my face at the center. I mean, this is like a disease. And I, sometimes I say, you know, tilt the camera a little bit low. My face doesn't need to be, OK, this is not so bad. But sometimes like my face, there's nothing at the top. And I'm like sitting at the middle of the picture, even lower. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to crop it. I'm going to take part of it and just make it a little bit smaller, as you see on the right. There is a little cropping button right here. Now cropping, is, you have to practice a little bit. It's a little bit tricky. Once you click in this button, you're going to see a crosshairs. Oh, actually the crosshairs <laughs> are in this picture. Nobody can see them, including myself. <laughs> They're supposed to be in this picture. There's a crosshair here. So the minute I, crossed, I, I press the button, the cropping button, it gave me a set of crosshairs. Now, I start with the upper left corner, then I hold the mouse button down, I go to the right corner, and, when I, and then I release it, it's outlined something, I can shift it a little bit, and then when I release the mouse, boop, crop. You need to practice. If you made a mistake, you hit undo, you're back to where you started. And there, there are choices, in, you can do free cropping, basically you can crop anything you want, or you can crop at a specific aspect ratio. Now let me tell you a little secret. Our club here projects 4 to 3 ratio. You see 4 to 3? If you want your image to fill as much area in the projection screen as possible, then you can fix your cropping in 4 to 3. Then you get the maximum projection area. But maybe that's not the, the composition you want, so really don't get hung up with that and do whatever you think is reasonable for your picture. Now the stereo window adjustment, that's the only adjustment you actually have to see in 3D to understand what I'm talking about. And it's very easily done in Stereo Photo Maker by using the right and left arrows of the keyboard. I mean, nothing could be simpler than that. If you watch the picture in 3D and you start hitting the right or left arrows, the whole scene moves back and forth, back and forth with respect to the screen. One arrow moves it back, the other arrow moves it, moves it in the front. So if you want to do special things that have something go through the screen, then you adjust your image to achieve exactly this effect. As I say, do this adjustment while looking the image at 3D, otherwise you don't know what's going on. This is a unique and powerful tool for 3D composition. You will get more points if your images shown in this club have a nicely positioned stereo window, which is a little bit subjective, by the way. Now, a note here. Somehow, Stereo Photo Maker does not consider the window adjustment as a change of the image. Anything else you do, if you crop, it will, and you try to load the next image without saving that one, it will, it will warn you. It says, do you want to save this? But for window adjustment, it's not going to say anything. So you adjust the window, and you don't save it, you press next, the adjustment is lost next time you load the window. You load the same image. So remember to save the image if you want to make the window adjustment permanent. I have to say a few things about opening and saving files that some beginners might find a little bit confusing. There are many ways to open a file in Stereo Photo Maker. You can grab the file and just drop it to the program, or you can go through Open File. If you go through Open File, you see a menu here. You make sure you're looking at the correct folder to find the file. It can, the program will open not just side by side, but individual right and left images. OK. As I said, if you hit the space bar, it goes to the next image in the same folder. And if you want to have Stereo Photo Maker do something, in, you can open more than one screen. Now, when you save the file, you have to be even more careful. And I think my friend Jim here, one day he says to me, look, George, I cropped this file, I saved it, then I opened it again, and I, it's not cropped. What's going on here? Like, my, it's, it was never, my cropping was never saved. I knew eagerly what happened. When you save a file, the program goes to the last, it doesn't go to the folder where you took it from. No, 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 no. It goes to the last folder where you save the file. So say one day you were working on a project, you were saving your image in a specific folder. The next day you're working on a different project, and you try to save the file, it's going to go to the old folder. Hmm. Windows. No, that's, the program could have, could have, the maker of the program decided that this is a better system. He could have changed that and make it where it saved where it came from. No, he thought this is a more logical system. However, it is confusing. So when you're ready to save, you will get a dialog like this. Look at the folder. If you don't go at the same folder, then you're, you're going to be saving your files who knows where, and then you cannot find them. Now, have in mind that it's going to warn you to overwrite. If you try to save something, and the file exists in that folder, it says, do you want to overwrite? File exists. That's a clue to you that you're saving the right. If it doesn't give you this warning, then you know you're not saving it where you th thought you were. Okay, so how are we doing? 
We cover a number of things, how to take your pictures, how to view them, how to edit them using Stereo Photo Maker. You're not done yet. If you really want to do well, you have to go to the step to, to improve your picture through contrast, color saturation, and so on. So what you need now is a different program. Even though Stereo Photo Maker has the ability to adjust brightness contrast, most likely most people already have an editor where they do 2D editing. For example, Photoshop, Photoshop Elements. So then, after you save your file with Stereo Photo Maker, you're going to open your Photoshop or whatever you're using. And by the way, if you don't have a photo editor, you can go in the internet, you can Google free photo editors, and there are many good choices, many powerful editors are given away for free. So you, can, you should always have a, photo, a general purpose photo editor in your computer. You go in there, and usually there's a button that says auto contrast or auto level. Just pressing this button will improve your picture. I always do that as the beginning to see what happens out of curiosity. What does the program think that my file needs? Most likely, it will increase the contrast a little bit. Now, since this is a tutorial about 3D, I'm not going to go into any details. Many of you, I know very little. As a matter of fact, I use Photoshop Elements 1.0. Right now, the program is at 10, version 10. <laughs> I bought version 10, I put it in my computer, and I didn't like it. I mean, I thought, too complicated. I couldn't handle it, so I, I erased it. I sold the program in eBay, and I went back to Photoshop Elements 1.0. Although that tells you how much of photo manipulation I do. Not much. However, there is a lot that can be done, and it's beyond the scope of this workshop. So if you really get into manipulating <coughs> digital images, you can become an expert and then give a little workshop in our club here. How to prepare the images for the uh, competitions? Our competitions require that you give a specific size or resolution. The images out of the Fuji are huge. You have to make them smaller. Now, Dennis Green just mentioned there is a possibility that this, this arrangement, which is 1,400 for one image times 1050 will change and increase to 1,600 by 1,200. Notice the ratio is, on all those cases, is 4 to 3. That's the ratio, the aspect ratio we're using. So. The images for the competition have to be stereo pairs inside one file, not separate right and left. It should be one file. JPEG, I think, right? Yes. Do you take MPOs? <laughs> no. It's JPEG. You, through Stereo Photo Maker, you can save a file. You can save it as an MPO or JPEG. It's up to you. I save all mine as JPEG. Borders are not required unless you feel they're needed for the presentation. Usually they confuse things if you don't know what you're doing. We recommend that you use Stereo Photo Maker to align your images first, adjust the stereo window, and then the next step is you need to resize them. In this screen, I show exactly what you need to do. I say load the image, hit R. R is a shortcut for resize. You can bring it through the menus. This screen will pop in. You check here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you should check the last one. <laughs> I have to change this. Keep aspect ratio with borders which means if your image doesn't have the 4 to 3 aspect ratio, the program will add a black border. So this should be checked here. And then you put inside whatever dimensions the club requires. Right now, this is what's required. That might change. You put those in, and then you say, OK. OK, fine. It will do that. It will make a smaller image exactly. It will put borders if, it's, if it doesn't have the exact aspect ratio. Then you need to name it. It's a mistake to override the original file. The original file contains a lot more information. This is downsized. When it comes to naming, the club requires that you use a specific format shown here. That helps us because when we download your image, you put them in the, the co computer, then we have a spreadsheet that automatically takes the name and extracts all the information, your name, your title, your image sequence. So first, there is some date information here, then one, two, three your image will be projected in exactly this sequence. Then you put your last name, dash, not, uh, not superscript or anything like this, then your first name, dash, then the title, and you can leave spaces in the title, <coughs> and that's it. No comma. Oh, no comma, it's not allowed, it will confuse the program. Okay, then you put your image in a flash drive, you give them to the person in the back. Any questions about this? Okay. Oh, 
Now we finished 101. You all graduated. I'm going to give you a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to 201. Listen, 201, there are a couple of things in Stereo Photomaker that are a little bit advanced. One thing is I show you the auto alignment. However, there's something called easy alignment. Now, I don't think, I don't know why easy is more complicated than the auto. It is more complicated. Easy alignment means you have full control over the things the program did. When you auto align a file, now you can go and manually do them yourself. Now, why would anybody want to do that? I don't know. However, there are some interesting things. I learned that at the NSA convention this summer. I never used this easy adjustment. I only did auto alignment. If you go to easy adjustment, you will get exactly the screen. Your image will be shown in an anagly format, so you can put your 3D glasses. You can uh, put a grid if you want, if you put a grid. Now, one of the things I learned, if you take a picture with a wide angle lens for a building looking up, you know the building will appear to be falling backwards. You can correct this. One of those adjustments here, I think it's the vertical. Anyway, there's a lot going on here. You can, oh, rotation is another thing. If you ever rotate the camera by mistake and the horizon is rotating like the sea level, that's really annoying. It's annoying in 2D, it's even more annoying in 3D. Now technically, you know, this is something funny, a lot of people don't understand this. If you rotate your camera, technically, you have a perfect stereo pair. Stereo photomakers is nothing wrong with it and it's not gonna try and rotate it back. It doesn't even understand what rotation means since stereo photomaker doesn't understand the sea level. It's only a psychological effect. So if that bothers you, you can get into the screen and then there's a rotation. Rotation right here. Most likely you will do right and left both. You rotate them, I don't know, two or three degrees. You cannot rotate 45 degrees because when you rotate, you're introducing errors actually. But if it's only a degree or two, that's fine. So you, you, you level the horizon. So there are a lot of things you can do in those screens. That's 201. And the other thing that I'm using all the time is called multi-conversion. I told you that I, you know, I went through the step of aligning one file. What if I went on a vacation and I took 1,000 pictures? You think I'm going to sit there and 1,000 times I hit auto-alignment? No. So what do I do? There's, this multi-conversion is like a batch mode. All you need to do, you go up here, you say where your pictures are. Oh, all my pictures are here, say, okay? Then what type is it? Side by side. The food is side by side, but you can have independent right and left. Then I check some things here. I want to auto-align, I want you to crop. And then over here, where do you want the aligning align files to go? It's not a good idea to override the ones you started from. Always, rule number one in digital photography, always save the files that came out of the camera. You might need them later. So I create a different output folder here, and then I click at this button. So now the computer, like a slave, it will start aligning, and I can go in at breakfast, lunch, or I can read the paper, or I can do something else in the computer. You know, this program is working in the background. As a matter of fact, I can even open another version of Stereo Photomaker and be doing something else while this version here is multi-converting all my files. Okay? George? George? Yes? Uh, just a question there, uh, uh, where it says edit and it says resize. Would you put the club resize 1400 by 10? 50 in there? You can, two, yes. You put the 2800 in there? Oh, the half. You see, we had this discussion recently. The, when the program takes you the dimension, it's only thing of one pair, not the entire thing. Okay. Only one pair of your stereo pair. By the way, I never do multi-conversion for the club because it's, so, it's only four files for the night, so I go one by hand. I resize individually, I rename them, I take the time because it's only four images. I use multi-conversion and I have to do a bunch of things. But you can use the same screens here. You can take files and you can break them to right and left, for example. You can take right and left and you can combine them. And this is an extremely powerful, powerful tool. It's a little bit confusing, though, because there are a lot of things going on. And as a matter of fact, I have to tell you something. A lot of people criticize Stereo Photo Maker and say, well, it's too, it, you know, the menus are not user-friendly. And then some other people get upset. The reason they get upset is this is a gift. The person that wrote this program, he decided to give it to the world for free. If you want to make a donation, he doesn't accept any donations. He cannot give him any money. There is no way to influence him. He created the program. He's a Japanese fellow. If you find an error or you have some suggestions, you can email them and he can reply right away. I mean, he's very friendly and he's open to suggestions. But people think it's a mistake to criticize them for some things. The program was written in the beginning. It got expanded. When it was written, there were no MPO files. 
When they came later, he changed the menus. So since things were built at the top of other things, they look a little bit confusing. But there is a very nice help file on the internet. You go and read the help file and then you play. And if you have a question, you try the menus, you see what they do. If you don't understand something, you ask somebody who knows. There is an email discussion list that um, will, will answer your questions. And that's how it goes, OK? So it is, and also we have DVDs that people have given workshops. It's a very powerful free program. Now, sooner or later, many of us will develop a routine to deal with digital images. And this helps do things faster and avoid mistakes. I outline my routine here. And I'm actually going to show it to you right now. One thing I have to tell you, number, um, what's the next screen? Uh, the last one, every month I back up my pictures. <laughs> you know what will happen if your computer crashes one day? You're going to lose everything. And anything you haven't backed up will be lost. So, by the way, I haven't backed my computer the last month, so I'm guilty. So back up only the things you need to say. At this point, I'm going to actually get out of this presentation. Okay. I'm using Windows 7 here, Windows 7. Something I do all the time, I have this open Windows Explorer here. As I said, in this computer here, I have C and D. If I go under D, that's where all my files are, 3D photos. I mentioned that I like this system where every month we're right here, right? Already I've done two nice activities. Now, can we have, what time is it? Do we have a little time left? Well, I'm only going to take five minutes of your time. I'm going to, can we have the lights on? I'm going to show you some of the uh, 3D cameras I'm using. This is the Pussy TV. Most of you have seen that. You don't seem to have seen it, right? I mean, you slide the cover down, and here are two lenses. There is a nice 3D display, so you can actually see 3D as you compose. There's the flash on. I can turn it off. This thing here is the cyclomical 3D attachment that allows me to use a flash in the camera. my uh, camera here, and then I can put the flash at the top. The flash of the Fuji is a problem. It's between the lenses. It, it looks very strange. So I take a picture of it. OK. Perfect. Now, these are fissile lenses. And with this attachment, I can attach those fissile lenses in the front. So now you have all the spaces. Pardon? <laughs> 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 now it looks like a serious camera, doesn't it? What are the prices on those different accessories? Of those attachments? Yes. 250 bucks. 250. Yeah. Almost as expensive as the camera itself. Now, I went to the Henry Ford Museum. I also took this system. These are the, the wire cameras. It's just a lens cap. See, the guy in the Netherlands will wire them, will also sell you this bracket. One camera sits upside down. Why does it sit upside down and not just to say it up? It puts the lenses closer together. Exactly. Especially this camera that the lens is off-center. If you turn one upside down, these particular cameras, they can come as close as 60 millimeters. That's pretty good. Or then you can loosen the screws and you can separate them in this bar. So you have a certain amount of flexibility. If you want more, and I mentioned my uh, hyper bar, then I can pull out this little bar here. Uh -huh. This, somebody gave me this idea in the hardware store. They used to sell these. Unfortunately, they don't anymore. I tried to get as many as I could, because then I would put some screws and sell them for more. So anyway, you put your covers. They can slide all the way to the end. Oh, for leveling. They have all those levels for hanging pictures in the wall. When I saw that, my face, like, I mean, I said, this is like, Somebody was thinking about 3D. Uh, 
There's no way they thought about hanging pictures and they created this. I mean, it's even graduated. What can I say? Now, the other thing I have, and I, I took a lot of pictures in the museum. This is just a single camera, Panasonic. It takes inter interchangeable lenses. This is a 28 millimeter lens. So I took a lot of pictures left and right, left and right. By the way, if you take pictures like that, when you go to Stereo Photomaker, you have to create a folder to separate the right and the left. You're going to put all your right pictures in one folder, all put left in another. Not only that, then you have to make sure that every pair matches. Stereo Photomaker, that's a digital 102, gives you the tool to compare them. So if you make a mistake and you forgot to take or you took two times for the left by mistake, then you have to delete them and make sure they're lined up. And after everything is lined up, I go through multi-conversions and I, I join them together, I align them. These ones are even more tricky because since one is upside down, you realize it needs to be reversed and then matched. Stereo photo maker will, will do all of that. Now, I have another one of these. And as it turns out, this particular one takes a remote control. A remote control, you press a button and you fire one. Now you might think, oh, all I need is to take two remotes, wire them together, and then I can fire those two. Well, it's not that simple as it turns out. But the guy in the Netherlands, it needs a specific resistance to fire the solder, like three ohms. So if you just join the wires, you're not going to get this resistance, and you're not going to fire. But he made this little box for me, so now even those, if I want, I can put them together and fire them. Now, there is no wires coming out. This, this camera is made to accept the remote control. All you need somebody to create this remote for you. And over here I have a um, macro box with the flash and some other <coughs> fancy things. But these are also two cameras that have been wired together and I can take them out and treat them just like I treat those. So these are some of the tools I've been using. George? Yes. Uh, how fast is the sink, how close is the sink on the uh, two uh, Lumix uh, G cameras? It's how not fast, perfect. I mean, can you do stop action or? As it, it turns out, out, you know, you think that's electronics, because it's the electronics complicated, and each camera might have a, it works a little bit <coughs> on its, its own. Close? There's, there's some delay, so I haven't tested the cameras for action. I haven't, at least, uh, even the wild ones are not perfect. Can you tell each camera to get ready to take the picture? Like, or is it just a single camera? Well, you, you have pressed the side to focus and get the cameras ready, but right. when you fully press it, there is no guarantee that it will be perfectly synchronized. The foot is perfectly synchronized. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. Just yeah, perfect. The other maker. ones, the stereo data maker that I explained with the Canon cameras is also perfectly synchronized. Yeah. But any wiring or things like that, you might be off a little bit. How expensive is that, ad that adapter he made for uh, linking two uh, this one? Yeah. I don't know what he charged me. I, because I bought a lot of things from him, as you can tell, <laughs> he might make it for me for free. I would guess like 50 euros, something like that. He works in euros. But he takes PayPal. And he's very, you know, no, in the United States, it's, he's not known. He's very known in Europe, but he's been doing this for a year, and people don't know him. So right now, very quickly, I'm going to take my my memory card out of my Fuji. My laptop has a card reader here, so I put it here in the computer. Okay. And, oh, a folder comes up here. Okay, uh, this one is my digital card right here. I'm putting a little bit on the side so I can see both of them. I put them side by side. Okay. Before I transfer any files, I need to create a new folder here, right? So I say new folder. How do you think I'm going to call this? 03 Detroit, right? That was my trip to Detroit for the month. Then I'm going to go inside here. And I'm going to create another new folder. And I'm going to call, this is my own routine, MPO. That's where I'm going to put the original MPO files that will come out of the Fuji. Then I click here, and I'm ready to transfer the files here. So I'm going here now to find the files. Where are they? Well, they're all hiding right here. Now, hmm, I need to see the dates. I don't grab everything. 9.14, that's the day. All these pictures I took today. 
You see, I've set my camera only stores MPO, no JPEGs. So I'm, the last file is right there. I hold the shift key and now I've selected all of them. And I simply, I go from here. And there's 75 pictures I took with the Fuji at the Henry Ford Museum or... George. Yes. What command lets you set all 75 files while you having to drain or... Select all of them? Select, yeah. Well, it, you can say select all, but I have files I don't select. So you need to highlight the first and then hold shift and highlight the last one, then they're all selected. So I put them here, right? So now, while this is going on, I can open my stereo photo maker. <coughs> Perfect. There are three ways I can, I can load the file. I can click here, I can go file, and then say open stereo image. I can hit W, or there's another way. This I'm done, unless if I want to clean. At some point I start deleting some files here to make space for my um, for more files to be stored. I click at it, I take the thing out of the, I'm done with it, I transfer it to my computer. Have you ever tried using the little uh, directory icon, which is the fourth one from the left? These? One more. Oh. One more. That one. That opens up a file images, and if you select your file, oh, then it, it, will show you. it shows you all the MPO previews. Well, let's try it. So that, that's a, uh, so I find that extremely helpful because now you can okay. do your file moving right and here. seeing the images in MPO format. Oh, they're on the MPO. Well, hmm. so now so you know what's going on. Now Very you know good. what your files are. Mm -hmm. And then you can... Then Here's a function that I haven't used in Stereo Photo Maker and somebody else has used it and they found it very useful. What I normally will do, I will go here and grab one of those pictures, see this one here, you can just drop it. I can drop it into the program. That's another way to load it. It, it oops, it's weird. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> what? Oh, I selected more than one. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was crazy. There they are. Every time I hit the space bar, it will go to the next one. It takes a few seconds to load. Suppose I like this, here's the auto alignment button right here, show you what happens when I press it. I press it, it works for a few seconds. Can you go over resizing them? Yeah. When you resize it, does that, does that change the si physical size on the screen when it's projected? Yes, both the physical si Well, it changed, but you won't be able to tell, though. Hmm. So anyway, he gives me this why, report. I'm it, this why do you do it? Well, it does not change the physical size on the projection. It's so why would anybody do it? Because it, oh. it's so huge. You're taking 10 megabyte files. To load a 10 megabyte file takes forever. Okay. So you can't go through. Yeah, you hit the button and you wait five minutes while it's loading it up. Well, we didn't resize anything last year. Well, maybe. The, so you now we're going to. We're not going to accept you. <laughs> no. It's a good idea we to resize, resize them because then they're huge and they take time if to load. If you didn't resize them and you submit them in here, we, 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 oh, you did it. we did it and it was, it takes too long. That's why we, we'll come okay. back and talk to you about it because it takes too long for us to do it. Right? Yeah. Anyway, okay. looking at this report, it looks pretty good. There's a very small vertical, adjust the window a little bit, 1 over 30, depth, perfect. I might enter this in Detroit. Now, suppose you want to crop. So now it's aligned, right? This is, the, this is the, the cropping button right here. And it's set for free cropping. I start here. Let's say I want to tighten it a little bit. Here, I hold the mouse button. I go to the other corner. Say here, I want to crop right there. I release it. Now there is a little bit of tweaking. But the minute, the minute I release it, it's done. Oops. Say I didn't want to hit undo. There is a Z thing. Then it goes back. And I say, well, let me try something else. I really wanted to just take this whole part. Or you click inside. If that's what you want, you click inside. And then you hit F. That's a nice shortcut that, that blows the whole picture to fit your, your screen. Now, suppose you decide, I want to enter this in Detroit. <coughs> so the first thing you're going to do, one of those buttons here is the resize. If you don't remember, I said R is a shortcut. Keep the aspect ratio with borders. You see how big the picture is? 3,580 pixels in the x direction, and we need to make this what? 1,400. Huh? 1,400? OK, 1,400 by? 1050. 1050. Check this. OK, you will see something happens in the screen, but you really, 
don't know this, but now you have to save it. If I hit the space bar trying to go to the next one, it will ask me, are you sure? I mean, save it. It's going to save it on top of the one that you have. Oh, so, so you have you to be to careful. Do, so you don't want to do that, you want to save it. So you want to say file, save. I know the shortcut is S. You see this S here? You can press S or select this or click one of the icons. Now you get this dialog. Now look where it's going here. Third dimension society. Well, that's the last time I, I entered some pictures from the for this exhibition and it remembers that folder. But that's nowhere near where I want to be right now. It's under my best pictures. No, 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 no. I want to be here and then I have to go searching for my folder where I put all that stuff. It's right here. It's Detroit. Uh, now I want to go here, or depending, I might want to save it at the root directory right there, and then hit save. And since it's the Detroit, I might you can change the name now, or you can rename later. If you save here, you can save here. Then going back to my folder view, I have to go one level back here. The file is saved. You can always go here and hit rename, and now I can edit and put you know whatever Detroit requires. Yeah, I, I do all that on multi-conversion. You see the thing? Multi-conversion, okay. Yeah, you, there's a file prefix area down at the bottom of the screen. So you can put the date in Detroit. Here's the multi-conversion. Now, normally what I will do right now at this point, I'm actually going to do it. Why waste my time during the break? It's not, why is, now it's looking at the correct record. The reason it's looking there is because, wait. That's the last place, That's the last place you saved it. Yeah. yeah, it's the correct one. Yeah. How come it doesn't show many files? Because, because you're, you're looking for files of type text. Change your file of type text. Check that. <laughs> well, there we are. They're side by side. This is what the output. I want the output to put this. I say check auto alignment, crop after. This color, you, there are a lot of things here that right now I don't need any of those. And I go here. As a matter of fact, I think it's looking at the correct folder. I do want to put all my corrected aligned files in the main de Detroit, not under the MPO. I'm only going to have my MPO, so this is correct. I'm going to say convert all files. And it says, it should come up with a screen. Where is it? Oh. Convert all files. Oh, convert all files. Where is it? Oh, you're looking at the uh, convert from the list. Yeah, I think you have to highlight them. Did I yeah. open the wrong thing? No, no you, you have to highlight them. them. Oh, yeah. Oh. Multi-conversion from slideshow list. Oh, what did I yeah. do? You just, you just I missed. went to the wrong place. Yeah, you just totally. That's why I didn't look familiar. I, yeah. Instead of this, I click at the next one. Who knows what the next one does? I don't. Oh, here it is. Looking at the correct folder. It's looking at all the files. These are checked. This is correct. Now, Con you look down below before you convert. Down underneath the browser yes. area, there's a prefix area. You may have to... There's no, actually, there are some little issues with... Yeah, there's some stuff yeah. at the bottom. Down here, you can put prefix and actually you can adjust the screen so it can save exactly with the correct title. Right now, all I want to do is to change those files, now align them all. Before you hit convert all, do you want to change your width and height to 1400? No, I don't. I don't want to change anything. He doesn't. I want to convert all I will do, align them. Well, you didn't check resize, so it's not going to take no, it back. No, I just want to align them. That's all I want to do. I always like to look at the aligned files. So convert all files, it says they're 75. Well, that's how many pictures I took. You want to start? Yes. That's now, it gives totally you this little report. <laughs> While this is happening, of course, you can go and do something else, including open this program again and do something else here. But let me tell you one thing. If you wonder, how does it do the auto alignment? It took the first file and it says it matched 150 points. How the program works, it compares the right and left and tries to find points that are the same in the right and left. Once it identifies, in this case, 150, this is a variable number, points that then it knows it's the same on right and left, like the second image, it found 206 points. Then it's trying to make those points align, like no vertical alignment. It's trying to optimize based on this matching, it found 150 points, and now it's going to adjust your image so those 150 points match. You see, it only takes, did it really take 20 seconds to do the first one? Yeah, yeah. yeah there, it's okay. So it would take a while, but this is it. It's working on its own. Now, if I go back here and see what's going on, oh, 
already I can see my files are being created. Now, over here, you can use I you can view the icons that show you exactly. Sometimes I like to go under just a list. I just want to see a list of things. I don't want to see the pictures. Sometimes I want to see the details. In other words, when they were created, what's their size. So I keep I play with those buttons. If you really want to see what they are, you put here extra large and you get you know large pictures of everything. You see, I took a few pictures while I was driving. Bad, bad. <laughs> Somebody else. Do you have any questions? I'm done here. I think I show you the basics. So did you guys learn something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.